I cannot believe that I have a store again. I swore I would never do this again, but I, I couldn't stay away too long. Hi, everyone. I'm Shuang Ezer Shan, and you're listening to Shopify Masters, your companion for starting and building a business. Our guest today is passionate about shopping at small businesses like no one else. Caroline Weaver has dedicated her newest business, the local Ver guide and variety store to help people find stores and products locally in New York City. She's here to talk about trends in retail and how we can all support our local economies through shopping with intention. Welcome to the show, Caroline. Thank you for having me. So the Locavore Guide is both an online resource, a subscription, and a physical store. Tell us about the idea behind this whole brand and why shopping locally was so important to you. This entire brand is all about shopping locally and shopping in person and not just the act of doing it, but all of the reasons why we should be doing it. And I come from a small business background. I used to own a really popular stationery shop called CW Pencil Enterprise, which specialized in wood cased pencils primarily. And when I chose to close it during the pandemic, there were a lot of factors at play and a lot of reasons why I decided to close. But one thing I was thinking a lot about was how there seems to be a lot of misconceptions in the small business space around what the function of an independent retail shop is and how to actually support it and what that looks like on a consumer side versus what that looks like from a shopkeeper side. That, that As it turns out, shopkeepers and consumers see it really differently. And so the whole point of the local work guide is to provide a resource to help actual New Yorkers shop local better, to do it more often, to understand the reasons why, to dispel some of the misconceptions about ways that it might seem harder or more expensive or inaccessible, and to remind them too that shopping can be really, really fun. And that's what these small businesses provide us, are these really wonderful little worlds that we get to escape to in real life, in our own cities. It's it's awesome. And I think being in New York, being a very competitive space, also arguably one of the most expensive cities to own a retail store. I guess from your personal experience of having that stationary business, what are some learnings you can pass on for people who are thinking about starting local businesses within their own community? There are definitely a few things. I think the first thing is that you really need to know the community that you're serving. You can't just choose a pretty storefront in a nice neighborhood because it, it's just there. You have to understand who your neighbors are and what they want and what they need and how to interact with them. And I, I think the biggest thing, though, when you're when you're opening a small business is you just have to trust your gut. You have to have a point of view and you have to trust it. And there's a place for any small business that exists just because the owner had the conviction to make it happen. And I say often that Everybody has great ideas, but there's a big difference between somebody who has a great idea and somebody who actually executes that idea. And so I think if you go so far to execute your good idea by opening a shop, you're halfway there already. I do kind of subscribe to the Field of Dreams idea of if you build it, they will come. And if you build a really good shop, people will show up and people can tell when it's when it's made from the heart, when it's not not trying to capitalize on a trend. You just have to trust your gut and have a point of view. That's It's really that easy. Having a point of view, offering an experience. And I think um, after COVID, there has been a rebirth, a resurgence of building up retail stores again. Has there been any trends you're seeing that makes you feel hopeful about independent shops opening up again? Oh, yeah. There are so many trends that I'm seeing that make me feel very hopeful. First of all, at least in New York City, there since well since the pandemic, there have been significantly more bookstores opening than there are bookstores closing, which I think is so so cool that that's that's the case. There are bookstores opening in New York City at, at least a couple a year, and it's been trending that way for a while now. And in this past year in particular, there have been so many vintage stores opening. There's this big like Gen Z driven wave of vintage and thrift stores that are just showing up everywhere. We hear about a new vintage store opening in New York almost every week. Um, it's it's incredible. And it's a market that I don't fully understand. My, my skeptical retail brain is like, there's no way that there's a big enough market for all of these. Um, and of course, it poses lots of other questions about the, the consum consumption of fast fashion and the turnover of all of it. But um, yeah, when it comes to these like slightly more specialized shop categories, 
we're seeing more of them opening than we are seeing shops closing. And there's also this observation that the newer generation of Gen Zs, they actually love shopping in person versus online. How has that impacted local economies? There have been recent studies that show that Gen Z, more than any other living generation, they want to be shopping in person, which um, I think is really wonderful. And what I think it's going to do in the next couple of years is just kind of recalibrate the types of shops that are in cities because the the majority of the demographic of people shopping in them are an entirely new younger generation. And so uh, it makes me wonder if we are going to see just more shops like these vintage shops that are opening or these, there are a lot of like really inspired newer grocery stores that are opening. And if, if there's going to be a little bit of a turnover when it comes to these older kind of like legacy old school shops closing and these newer ones coming in. And I think that that can be really exciting. I don't think that that's always a bad thing. And I think you are such a true advocate for supporting independent shops, revitalizing local economies where you created this project and this resource, and then it's grown into a subscription business. So talk to us a little bit about the evolution of the Local War Guide. Yes. Uh, originally, I just wanted an easier way to find shops. In New York City, there's tens of thousands of shops. And I was personally, because I very much live this lifestyle of trying to buy everything locally, I was tired of having to search through like the first eight pages of a Google search to find something that was what I was looking for because it's just so buried because of the way that SEO works and because of all the sponsored posts and ads. And so I just wanted to create a resource to help people find shops more easily because a lot of people like the idea of doing it, but they don't want to do the work. And so I thought if I can remove a step maybe people will be more likely to subscribe to this lifestyle, especially if it's on a website that's really like colorful and fun and well-designed. And so I originally was supposed to just be a physical guidebook because I, I mean, I come from stationery, I come from an analog world. And so that's what I wanted to do. And then realized very quickly, once I started collecting the data that I was really in over my head and that there was so much to work with that I, there was no choice, but to put it in a really well-organized online database um, and I think currently our database has over 14,000 shops and I'm not done cataloging the city yet. I estimate that by the time I'm done, there'll be about 17,000. And that's just way more than I could ever have in a physical guidebook. And it's exciting because you're also going on these local adventures to, um, also help out with shoppers in their journey. How did the subscription piece come into play? Well, with an information resource, I needed some way to try to monetize it. And we only launched about a year ago officially. And so it's very much something we're trying to work through. But a lot of the, the additional resources that we provide are our paid features in our attempt to monetize this resource. The, the directory itself, it's really important to me that it not only be free and accessible to everybody, but that you don't even have to use an email address to use it. You can just go on the site and dive right in. There's no work involved at all. But some of the additional content, like we have a, a shopping hotline phone number that members have access to that they can text or call us anytime if they need something really specific. And me or one of my colleagues will reply and like, tell them where they should try to look for it. And we have great editorial content, most of which is free, but occasionally not. We also have a weekly newsletter where we get pretty granular when it comes to like news around town that's shop related and just things that we, we hear about, trends that we notice, a little bit of gossip sometimes. Um, we offer a discount in our store. So there, we're, we're trying to find a way to monetize this in a way that doesn't subscribe to all of the things that we are ethically against. It's really difficult to build a business, whether it be an information resource or a shop or any sort of business that is values and ethics space because like we can't do advertising because the types of businesses who can afford to do advertising, substantial advertising on a website are not small businesses. They're what we're encouraging people to avoid. And so it's um, it's a complicated thing. And, I, and I've not figured it out. I'm still navigating it. And I, I very much am of the opinion too that the whole subscription thing is a little oversaturated. People are tired of having to pay $5 a month for everything. I think the approach you take is making it accessible so that the guide anyone can access. And then you are providing this additional value if they choose to subscribe. And then you're also looking into scaling the brand through the physical store. So talk to us about your re-entrance into retail as well. I cannot believe that I have a store again. I swore I would never do this again, but I, I couldn't stay away too long. I do think that most people who have shops and have done e-com and physical stores or both can attest to the fact that what a physical store exists as, as much as it 
does a store is it's marketing. And for, for us, especially like we, I wanted to create a, a space that was friendly and engaging and really fun to shop at where people could come in and visualize this lifestyle that I'm trying to sell them. And it's a much easier sell when you can see it and you can experience it and it's tangible and you can talk to a real person. And we're, I'm selling, I'm selling a lifestyle of shopping, not only shopping local, but doing it in person and going outside and engaging with your neighbors and asking for an expert opinion. And so to be able to actually demonstrate that, I think is really important. And for any shop that most, I think these days, most people are smart and they do e-com first. And then once they feel stable and they've made some money, they go and they open a physical store. And I think that most shopkeepers that I know have experienced that once they open that physical store, that's when it takes off because the people are able to visualize it. And it's it's funny to me that we live we live such online lives, but there are all these little pieces of evidence that indicate that these in-person moments, these in-person experiences are still so, so vital to our existence. Totally. And I think you're carving your own path in entrepreneurship which is so interesting. And you're not taking that traditional like e-com store first approach, um, which I think is important to highlight. So within your store, you also have your own merch for the brand, as well as a curation of your favorite things, I would say around the city. So um, yeah, tell us about like the things that you source and how you go about like building those relationships. The local bar variety store, which is the name of my shop, it's, it's, basically a general store that sells mostly products made within a hundred miles of New York city by entirely independently owned brands. We don't sell any big brands, even if they are made locally. And we do sell some of our own products and we even brought back a pencil that I used to, that I designed that I used to have made for my old shop. It's made in Jersey city. The, um, it's a fun fact. America's oldest pencil company is in Jersey city, New Jersey. They've been around since 1889. Um, but the the shop is a really fun mix of really, really old businesses like that. We also have pickles that you can get out of a barrel. You can come in and use tongs and fish out a single pickle from the oldest pickle house in New York City in Massabeth, Queens. And you can shop home goods and gifts and pantry items and toiletries and stationery, books, all of these things which are made by other small businesses. And a, a lot of them are people that I already knew or people that I've encountered along the way. A lot of these businesses I found because I peeked through a factory door when I was out documenting that neighborhood. And it's it's been fun to see how many people come in and see something they recognize and cannot believe that it is actually made here. Um, a good example is wiffle ball, like the yellow plastic baseball bats with the balls with the holes in them. Those are made in Connecticut by a family-owned business, and that's all they make is a wiffle ball. That's so fascinating. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to prove this point that it's around us, whether we realize it or not. We're we're all of this stuff is around us, and when you choose to seek it out, there are a lot of really wonderful things to discover. I think shopping locally also extends to entrepreneurs. So, how can they think about sourcing locally for their products or materials? Yeah, the way that we source products now, there are, it's so complicated because there are so many channels. It used to be that you just traveled and found things, or you went to trade shows, or you asked around. Like that was those were your only options. And now we have websites like Fair. We have uh, all these research forums. We have trade shows that are entirely virtual now. Like it's so different. And um, I don't know, especially for shops that exist that kind of like in the lifestyle space, I notice a lot of them sell the same stuff that you that they're seeing at the same trade shows or that they're seeing as the same like suggested products on fair. Um, and I don't know. I think when sourcing, the, the the best thing to do is to look at what your store is trying to accomplish and split it up, not by just kind of willy-nilly looking for stuff that is lovely and that will fit into the vibe, but by going through and trying to decide like, what are all the product product categories you're trying to hit? And then do that research in reverse um, and look for whatever that particular item is based on whatever your parameters are. If you're, if you're buying local goods, if you have an aesthetic in mind, if you have a, a country of manufacture or a price range or whatever, instead of just filling your store with stuff that might not make sense with the overall vision, if that, if that makes sense. But on a whole, one thing that I think that we've lost track of a little bit is the idea of just asking people for help, that we don't have to be experts in everything, that you can ask somebody who knows more than you do and trust that they're going to give you a good answer. And I see this in the way that people shop, that they research like what the best... I don't know, like the the best 
Bluetooth speaker is beforehand and maybe buy it online or they go to a store and they already think they know what they want because they've done their own online research. But in reality, you're, especially if you're shopping at a small business that's specialized, that shop owner, that person working in the shop is going to know more than you. Like you should just save your time and just ask them for advice. They'll have good advice. And I think the same goes for sourcing for your shop. And I I lean on the people in my network all the time when I'm I'm looking for something like I don't know, linen napkins, and I'm not sure where to find them. And I know somebody who has amazing taste and I'll ask them like, well, what are some linen napkin brands that you've heard of that might be local? And then we'll just go from there or people in the food world. That's not my area of expertise. I've leaned on a lot of people for help with that. And so, yeah, ask your friends, ask your friends to ask their friends. You know, somebody who knows somebody who has a great shop in another part of the country where you're not their competition, like they'll help you. Um, yeah, I think I think we there's a lot of social anxiety around the way that we interact with each other in the world of business and in life. And um, yeah, just ask for help. Having that mind shift of looking locally and also like actually leaning on people that you know, I think it's really good practical advice to think about sourcing locally for like all the small businesses you've been able to learn about. Has there been something that has surprised you in the process? In New York City, especially, I i mean, I live in Manhattan. Most of my friends live in Brooklyn in the same neighborhoods. I i live in a pretty insular world here. And even though I do travel to other boroughs, I'm very adventurous. I love going on a little day trip. I Going to a lot of these neighborhoods that are further out in the outer boroughs that I'd not seen before really reminded me of the place of commerce in a community that a lot of these New York City neighborhoods that I had never seen before do have thriving main streets and they're they're not full of chain stores. And so the people in that community really rely on and shop at those stores on their main streets because it's the most convenient because they the guy who works at the fish shop is probably like the third generation and they knew his dad or there's there there are these thriving little hubs of retail that are really unexpected in a lot of neighborhoods that you might not expect to find and and I feel naive for not knowing that and was really I was really happy to find really good examples of functioning main streets in New York City and the way that that functions differently to like Say like you're in you're in the West Village, and the West Village is nobody's opening a shop there because it fulfills a need for the most part. You're opening a shop there because it's a high traffic area where people have money, and you want to have a shop. And so these neighborhoods function so differently, and I think that's been like the most surprising thing to see just how differently they function, and how how some neighborhoods do it better than others, and how some neighborhoods, I mean, are really successful in filling their storefronts and selling goods that are just necessary. I mean, that's originally what retail was. You opened a shop because your butch- your local butcher retired and you need a butcher shop in your neighborhood or um, because there's a new trend and like nobody's selling that thing. You open a shop and you sell it. It's um, yeah, really, really is what retail was intended for. Big cities are filled with neighborhoods and their local stores really support those economies. Very excited to chat more about the creative side of the local war guide. Real quick, I just wanted to thank you for tuning into the show. Make sure to subscribe to Shopify Masters wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss an episode. We also have a giant backlog of episodes with some of the most interesting business owners on Shopify if you ever want to go back and listen. Thank you. Also, another thing I think it's beautiful about the start of the Local Wars Guide is because this is a creative format that has allowed you to be exploring the city, um, have a sense of expression as well. And this is something that's grown um, because you were cataloging the city. Talk to us through that creative side, that initial days of just simply cataloging and creating. Yeah, it's um thank you for recognizing that it really is a creative in- endeavor because it's I'm collecting information, but um it's a humongous city. It's been a really it's been a really fun journey to try to figure out how to tackle it. And um I've had to be flexible and organized. And I started thinking that I was just going to go to these neighborhoods, find the little pockets where there's lots of retail and just take it from there. But it turned out to be a lot more than that I never could have anticipated that I wouldn't even be done and I'd already be at 14,000 shops. Um, and having to to go out and catalog these neighborhoods while also thinking about 
how are other people going to interact with it? They're not here with me and I want them to come here. And so how do we design a website that makes it easy for them to find these places and to feel inspired to come to them while not misrepresenting the businesses that we are including. And so it's important to me that everything is unbiased and that we kind of leave it open for people to explore. And for me as the explorer, I get to go into these neighborhoods that I've never been to. I don't even do that much research. I kind of just leave it up to chance. And I, I have a rubric for the information that I gather. And I will sit down and look at a map ahead of time to gauge what the layout of the neighborhood is. And I've gotten really used to city planning patterns. And so I can tell where some areas are going to be residential and some are going to have lots of shops. And then I just have to go out with the, my little explorer hat on and be open to going down a street I didn't think I needed to go down because it looks like there's houses, but there's something else that looks different. And that might be a shop. And it often is. Or um, I have to be creative about how I find information. I spend a lot of time at diner counters during lunchtime. Um, Every neighborhood has a good diner and that's a reliable place to have lunch. And so I end up asking a lot of questions from neighbors I meet at a diner counter. And um, yeah, it's, I think a lot about Harriet the Spy. Do you know the book, Harriet the Spy? I I feel often like I'm Harriet the Spy, like roaming around New York City, just making observations and acting on what I'm noticing and hoping for an interesting result. And so while it is a very repetitive process of data collection, a lot of the more interesting things that I've found and that I've trusted my gut on and that I've, all these little side quests I've chased are the things in the end that create good content for social media, good editorial stuff for our website. Um, and just a good reminder that if you're curious and creative and have an open mind, there are still so many things in New York City that are like legitimate hidden gems. And I think highlighting this aspect of creativity is so important because the genesis of your business is so unique, and I think it's going to be valuable for our listeners to think about approaching ideas for business in a different way. Nowadays, how much do you spend or dedicate your time towards content creation and storytelling in the everyday operations? Content creation and storytelling is is a pretty heavy focus for me right now. Um, now that I've done the bulk of the cataloging in the city and I have a really organized and great team who maintain the database and keep everything up to date. And so I get to focus on the really fun stuff and sharing information about the products that we sell and sharing information about the places that I found too is so important in driving this narrative and selling this lifestyle that we're not just telling you how to find the shops. We're also giving you a little hint as to why why you should be shopping at them. And I, and I think that we've got to be more creative too and not just be posting like features on shops. Like we just do a, a feature that we call Ask a Shopkeeper where one of our freelance writers will go and talk to a shopkeeper that they really like to see where they like to shop because shopkeepers do have the best recommendations because they're so in tune with that world. And uh, we try to think of like out of the box ways to create content that's about shopping. That's not just us telling people where to shop because I think there's too much, especially in media, especially in New York City about highlighting shops that are deemed like the best or the coolest or, and I say all this with air quotes because I just think that that's not a productive way to label things, especially when there's such a vastness of stuff to choose from. Or like there's all this space in media for like these mom and pop shops, these like legacy shops that are quaint and charming and have a history. But like it's all the shops in between that I'm the most interested in. The ones that are just serving a neighborhood and doing something weird and cool and interesting and doing it quietly, they're not getting press because they're just... They're just doing their jobs well, and they just care about being really good at that one thing that they do. And so those those are the shops I'm most interested in that we try to highlight the most. But I also feel like for this platform in particular, what I'm trying to do is cultivate a voice that is trustworthy and friendly and not judgmental about around all of this stuff too. Because in the retail world right now, there is, really isn't anybody speaking on behalf of retailers and speaking about this whole idea of shopping local and shopping small that that's that's qualified really because anybody with an economics background unless you've owned a small business you don't know what it's actually like it's so different to experience it than to just research it and talk about it and so all this on the ground research all of this content that we're creating just by talking to people and following leads all of that is so important because there's a human element to it and i don't think that there's a voice in small business retail right now who's tapped into that 
I think it's also very important, especially in nowadays where there's so much seasonality with business, with um, Black Friday or the holiday season, where it gets even tougher for local businesses to compete against some of the giants. So what's your advice there for either small business owners or shoppers to still embrace local during those periods? Yeah, I, the, especially during holiday season and traditional sale periods, it is such a complicated thing because small businesses sim- simply cannot do the same things that big businesses are doing. And consumers don't understand why. They want to know why they're not getting free shipping everywhere. They want to know why a small business isn't doing a Black Friday sale. And I, I'm always paying attention during this time of year to the email newsletters I'm getting because a lot of small businesses have gotten really good about not defending themselves, but sending these emails that really eloquently explain why they don't do it. And my job and what I do, and we did this last year and we'll do it again this year, is to be really loud about educating people on the why of all of it. Because most consumers don't understand that these big stores, they're building those margins into their original prices of their products in order to be able to give you 50% off. You're ending up paying what you should have been paying in the first place for a product that, that's cheaper than they've made you think it is. And so a lot, I think it's it's so frustrating to be a small business during holiday season because so much of people's conceptions of what products should be sold as and how they should be sold during holiday season is so messed up by corporate marketing and by all of these manipulative tactics that these big businesses use to make you think that you're getting something when in reality you're not. And you'd be better off just paying full price at an independent retailer for a thing that either costs the same and isn't tricking you or is better quality and might cost a little bit more. Of course, I think supporting local businesses, shopping there is also a way for people to have a peek in someone else's world through that shopping experience. How can a business owner build this feeling for their customers when they're conceptualizing or building their small business? Yeah, it's. I think a lot of first-time shop owners especially go into it with this kind of cloak of self-consciousness because you're worried about your shop looking professional or looking, I don't know, or following whatever the the current trend is in merchandising a shop. And I, I think like the most important thing you can do is just have your own point of view and trust your personal style and just run with it because you might do something that's beautiful that looks like every other shop, but that's not a compelling reason for people to come in. And they're not going to have a unique experience there no matter what you're selling. I think, I think to set the tone for a really engaging and experiential shop, you just have to do something that other people aren't doing and to trust your gut and to not compare yourself to other people's shops. I think that's, that's the most important thing is to, um, and add, add in little details. Like you're not just selling things, you're creating an experience. So what's an interactive thing that you can do? Like what, what's something silly that you can put in a beautiful vending machine? What's some sort of like hands-on way of selling something that could create a really interesting Instagram or TikTok moment. For us, that's the pickle barrel that we have in our shop. Customers are just like so amused and delighted that we have a pickle barrel in our shop in the year 2024. Um, And so I think, I think that's, that's all you have to do is just don't compare yourself to others, have a point of view and just really run with your ideas and no idea is too weird or too colorful or too strange. People are going to come in and just be really happy that you're not doing the same thing everybody else is. No idea is too strange. And I think you truly embody that because your journey is so unique. And I think a lot of creators can relate to your journey because it did start something as a creative outlet and then it grew into a business. What's your final piece of advice for people who might feel a little weird about monetizing something that they're creating or even thinking about a business idea? from a creative project? How do they get past that mental hurdle and actually start the business? I think an important thing to remind yourself, and this gives me a lot of peace of mind and makes me feel like I'm not constantly selling something, is if you can arrange your business so that there are there are the things you're selling. For me, it's subscriptions. For me, it's goods in my shop. Um, for somebody else, it might be something different. You've got the things that you're selling. and then And then you have the little things that aren't ever going to make any money that you maybe break even on, or maybe you're not making any money on it. And the other things subsidize that. Like if you keep some of these other little things for yourself, you're always going to feel okay about 
selling something because you've kept one small little creative outlet, no matter what that is. Maybe it's a product or a project or a community service or an event that you host regularly that is just for for the hell of it and just for fun. And because it serves your creative mission and that is it, um, if you can keep a little slice of that for yourself, I think it's a lot easier to get over the hurdle of not feeling weird about constantly selling something. Amazing. Keeping a little slice of joy for yourself. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Caroline. Thank you for having me. This was wonderful. That's Caroline Weaver, founder of The Local War Guide. Our show is produced by Megan Coyle and Gogo Zoger. Engineers are Miku Betlam and Matt Short. Our managing producer is Benjamin Gottlieb. And I'm your host, Shwang Esther Shan. We got brand new episodes for you every Tuesday and Thursday. Thank you so much for listening. 